Thanks, Jeff. All right, we'll just open our Bibles to Genesis and chapter 15. I know now how to blame others for something you do. You just tell them someone else did it. (laughs) Isn't that right, Jeff? Blame Tony for something you did? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Genesis 15. So I just want to talk a little bit today about the Lord understands our weaknesses and he still works with us. And um, I suppose for any one of us who are filled with the Holy Ghost, we go through times where we're praying about something and we're looking to the Lord and expecting a a miracle and uh, at times we're maybe doubting or we're thinking about other things and we get distracted or or whatever in our walk in the Lord. And um, I suppose when you look into the scriptures there, God's always understood this and that's why he needed to give us a spirit to start with because we're flesh and blood and we, we always tend to go off you know, uh, in our own ways and the Bible says of course the natural mind, the carnal mind is an enmity with God or it's against God, it thinks totally different. But uh, we're just going to have a look at a, a story in the Old Testament here, one that some of us know very well and uh, maybe some who don't. So we're about Abraham and, and Sarah and how they were promised to, to have a, uh, a child. And uh, through this situation, I suppose when you look at it, you know, we can look into the scriptures in the New Testament that talks about how they were faithful and believing. But we just want to have a look at a few scriptures. And in Genesis 15, here we read in verse 1, and uh, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. So at this stage, the only one that really, uh, a relative of um, Abram here was, was uh, his brother's son, Lot, who he was looking after, and that was the only heir he had, and he was childless, and uh, he uh, obviously desired to have a child, he desired, you know, as uh, most mothers and, you know, men and women, when they get married, do desire to have children. And uh, he'd been out there serving God, so to speak, and uh, he'd gone before Melchizedek there and he blessed them and him and he'd given him uh, a tithe of everything he possessed it talks about. And uh, and maybe he was thinking, I'm doing all the right things, everything's, you know, so God, what are you going to give me? You know, I've I've done everything for you, what are you going to give me? And uh, I'm childless and, uh, you know, things aren't working out the way I expected in life at this stage. And uh, we read in verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, as in Lot wasn't going to be his heir, but he shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So he says of his own vows, and as you look into it, it's more talking about his, him and his wife, Sarah there, that uh, that was exactly what was going to happen. They were going to have children. The promise was there. And uh, God was going to, um, to bless him in this situation. He called out to God, and God had answered him. It was quite simple, wasn't it, really? And um, when we look into this um, situation, I suppose we can be a little bit like this. Lord, I'm doing everything that you require of me. What are you going to do for me? I mean, for us, we know Jesus died for us and has given us everything. But, but there's maybe times where we sort of think, well, you know, I'm worthy in some way for you to give me the things I desire. And, uh, and uh, you know, God does give us those things, but he also does look upon the attitude of our heart. And um, we see here, of course... As we see with Abram there, he asks for this. God says he'll do it, and he he promises him in abundance that he's going to become a father of uh, nations, as we most of us know. And um, he was going to have a child, as it says there through Sarah. But um, we read in chapter 16, Now Sarai, 
Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Or this word just means uncertain or foreign. So she was an Egyptian. She wasn't even of his descendants. She was someone who uh, really, you know, I don't believe at this stage it was God's plan because he promised it was going to be of his own seed. And um, he maybe wasn't seeing things as clear, clearly as he should have. And, and uh, we go on to see how Sarah approached this. In verse 2, And Sarai uh, said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me, restrained me from bearing. I pray they go in unto my maid. Uh, it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. So Abram here, it was a promise. And uh, he, uh, of course, uh, his wife there, he no doubt talked to her, explained to her exactly how things were going to be and how they were going to have children. God had promised it. And, and um, what ended up happening was they uh, decided to do it their own way. And uh, this was, you know, after 10 years, they were waiting some time for this promise and uh, it hadn't gone their way. And uh, it's very much like any one of us. We pray about something, it doesn't go our own way, and sometimes we can look to the flesh. We can, we can look to other ways for the answer for what um, God's going to do in our lives. But uh, we see that from this situation, because they'd started to do it their own way, things hadn't necessarily become easy. And uh, that's uh, what can happen when we start to do things ourselves or in the flesh. It says... Um, she was upset, of course, because the Lord had, uh, as far as she was concerned, restrained her from having children. I pray thee, halfway through verse 2, I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. So not only now has he decided you know, to listen to his wife, he maybe should have said to her, no, God has promised that we're going to have children um, of our seed and uh, it's going to work out, everything's going to be okay. But he hearkened to her voice and uh, from there, of course, things tended to go wrong. And uh, that can be what happens if we don't trust in God, if we don't believe what he's promised unto us uh, and things can change for us. It says um, in verse 4, And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So all of a sudden then there was conflict within the household. There was a lot of things going wrong. The mistress here, who um, was Hagar there, uh, she um, was despised by Sarah because she'd had a child and she hadn't been able to. And so um, all of a sudden, you know, there was outside influences there that had come into the house because, uh, you know, there was uh, Hagar there. She was a maid. That was her role in the house, wasn't it? It wasn't to be Abram's, um, you know, to be there to bear the seed. And uh, from there it says, you know, in verse 5, And Sarah uh, said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, um, <clears throat> not sure if it's Sarah or Sarai here, but <laughs> keeps changing when I say it. Um, <clears throat> Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Uh, do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai uh, dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. So it came to a point where there was, there was uh, so many problems within the household there that Sarai had actually persecuted Hagar and she wanted to flee out of the house and go her own way. And, uh, you know, just from maybe a, a natural point of view, you can see that all of a sudden, rather than relying upon God's promise and it being simple, it had become complicated. And uh, so it can be for any one of us when we complicate things rather than you know, keeping it simple according to what God has told us, according to his plan, according to the way he wants to direct our lives. And, and uh, in verse 7, And the angel of the Lord found by her a fountain of water in the wilderness by a fountain in the way to Shur. And, uh, you know, the Lord looked after uh, Hagar there, but as I said, you know, there was a certainly deterioration from the minute they changed things. 
And, uh, you know, for those who know, of course, Ishmael was born uh, of Hagar there. And, uh, of course, um, Abraham and Sarah later had Isaac. And, um, you know, there was even right from the beginning when... Um, Isaac was born, there was a conflict there between both sons and that conflict goes on and of course we can go, I'm not going to go into any prophecy concerning the, the nations as far as you know the, the um, is, Israeli people and of course the um, Iranians and the Iraqis and all that, I won't go into all that but you think about it, it all started from this, <laughs> you know all the deterioration that we see in the world at the moment started from this situation. And, uh, I mean, you know, that's just a prophecy. But uh, through this, of course, even though, you know, they got their eyes off the Lord at this point in time, God was still there and God was still faithful. And uh, we'll go to um, just a, a little bit more about this in Genesis 17, verse 17. <clears throat> This is when Abram was told he was still going to have a uh, child of his own seed. And um, uh, verse 15 will start. And God said unto Abraham, Abraham, as for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah. So yeah, I was calling them the wrong name there. So Sarai to Sarah. And um, <clears throat> Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her. And give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old, and shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? So even so, at this stage, Abraham and... Uh, we'll, we'll later on read... We'll read it in um, chapter 18... And in verse 11, Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall, be, shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord at the time appointed? I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So both of them questioned, both, both of them laughed. Abraham, even in his heart, didn't believe, really, because otherwise he wouldn't have been laughing at God saying that. And, and Sarah was looking at it saying, I'm old. It, it's not going to happen. And, you know, I suppose in one sense God could have said, Oh, look... <laughs> This lot don't believe. <laughs> they really don't believe that I'm going, I promise this child it's going to happen, it's going to be as I've said, but God was still working with them. And God still works with us no matter what our situation, no matter where we are at that stage in, in looking for that victory or look, looking for the Lord to direct some situation or to provide for us. Whatever it might be, he's still interested in us and, and he understands our weaknesses. He understood... You know, Abraham and Sarah here, their, their weaknesses, they, they were old. In the natural sense, there's no way they were going to have children. You know, if we say to someone who's 60 years of age, you're going to have children, well, you know, people said to me when I got married, I can't remember how old I was, but they said, are you going to have children? I thought, no way. <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've been down that road, and uh, they, they used to say to me and Tina, you're going to have children. And even at that age, it's almost, uh, you know, not going to happen. But here they are, and, uh, you know, we read of their ages, and, uh, you know, God was saying, look, I can do this. Against all opposition, he'd, he'd said, you know, at the time appointed, it's going to happen. The thing I've said is surely going to come to pass. And that's how our God works. He wants us to see. Faith comes by, you know, not the things we see in the natural, but it comes by what we believe within and uh, what God can do for us and how he can change us. And, um, you know, we look at um, <clears throat> this story here and it goes on to say, you know, later on, of course, you know, what ended up happening was uh, Lot and 
nearly got killed and that was um, Abraham's only heir at the time and maybe that's why he fought so hard for Sodom not to be destroyed for those who know the story you know if per adventure you know whether it be you know I can't remember the numbers at the moment but 50 and then 20 10 and then 5 who were going to survive but uh, he he um, maybe Abram was desperate for that to survive because you know Lot was his only heir, and maybe he believed that it was still going to be through that. I'm not too sure, but that's uh, in the next story that we find um, in Genesis here. But in chapter 21, and. Um, in verse 21, no, verse 1, sorry. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded, and this is 13 years later here that uh, Abraham and Sarah have a child. So uh, quite some time had passed, but God still fulfilled His promise. And of course, that's what He does with, with um, whoever it is, as we continue to believe. And and things must have changed in their belief at some stage, because if we just go to um, the Book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Verse 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. So at some stage, she judged God faithful. She had laughed. Abraham had laughed and within his heart didn't believe. But at some stage, it had changed because it says here, she judged him faithful uh, who had promised. And I find it interesting here, you know, later on it talks about how by faith Abraham, you know, was prepared to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, but here it's talking about Sarah. So uh, we don't know necessarily, you know, maybe it was Sarah's faith because it's her who gets the mention here as far as in the book of Hebrews, the, as many of us know, the great stories of faith in the book of Hebrews there. So it doesn't matter where it comes from, but the Lord is faithful. And, uh, you know, as I said, there was a lot of um, problems within their life because of their unbelief at times and because they'd done things their own way. And, uh, you know, I suppose each and every one of us, we can be like this. But we want to make sure that, of course, in the end, no matter what we go through, we do things the way the Lord wants us to. We do things that are according to his will and purpose. And, uh, you know, as it says in verse 10, for he looked for a city. This is talking about um, Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So, so that's what we look for. Rather than getting bogged down with our problems, our needs, our desires, you know, the things that go wrong in our lives, and they do go wrong, then, uh, you know, when those things happen, we keep remaining faithful. I guarantee anyone who's been in the Lord some time has been through some pretty heavy tribulation <laughs> at some stage, you know. We all go through those things, but it's when we get through to the other side and we, we overcome and we see, like Abraham and Sarah did in the end, when they were holding that child, you can guarantee they forgot about everything they went through. And uh, as I said, there was even conflict as far as um, with um, Ishmael there and, and um, Isaac. You know, right from birth there was problems. And you can guarantee, I mean, it ended up that Ishmael was put out of the house and God did look after him and did bless him. But, uh, you know, there was... You know, there was a blended family from that time where it wasn't as easy as it would have been. 
you know, um, and uh, sometimes we've got to make sure that we don't bring upon ourselves problems that are going to, not so much blended families, we can work through anything like that, but blended problems in our lives where we bring things in that are going to uh, dis- uh, go against our faith and the things we want to be involved in and uh, what God's called us unto. We'll just go to um, Mark chapter 9. Totally different story here, but a, a story, I guess, of of um, someone who um, wanted, you know, the the blessing of God, like um, Abraham and Sarah. There, they wanted the blessing of God, but uh, you know, they got distracted, as I said, by certain things. And um, you won't find it in Luke nine. I can tell you that much. <laughs> Mark chapter nine. And in verse 18, so this is talking about a man here who brought his um, child that was dumb unto Jesus Christ, and uh, he was very distraught. Everything he um, desired to happen wasn't happening in his life. And um, from a young child, this um, child had been peers possessed and going through great trauma where he'd been cast into the fire and into the water, and uh, this whatever it be inside of him was tearing him and he was foaming at the mouth and uh, it was a very sad situation but this man here was prepared to do whatever it took to uh, see God work in his life and uh, and the Lord understood as well with this situation I mean I'm only going to go through two stories really here I've got a lot of other stories but but um in verse 18 and wheresoever he taketh him he teareth him and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away or he, he's shriveling up he's virtually dissolving this uh, young child and uh, this man here is trying to do whatever he can he says and I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out and they could not so the disciples were going about preaching the gospel and doing what they should and uh, they couldn't cast him out and maybe they felt pretty hopeless at this stage as you would and and feel like almost you know god jesus has told us we're going to be able to perform these miracles etc in verse 19 and he answered him and saith o faithless generation how long shall i be with you how long shall i suffer you bring him unto me and they brought him unto him and when he saw him straightway the spirit tear him and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming as soon as this happens, this this devil or whatever was in this side, this person, you know, is realizes that Jesus Christ is there, and he knows his numbers up. You know, things are going to change, and and maybe sometimes, you know, we're there and we're calling unto, you know, calling to the Lord for the miracle, and uh, we we feel like we are a faithless generation. We're not believing, and uh, you know, but we just keep calling unto Jesus. And, uh, you know, he's there instantly sometimes. And sometimes, as I said, it's down the track a bit, but the Lord's always there. He's going to answer, you know, and, uh, you know, he's there and he cares for us and he understands through our weaknesses, through our problems, as he did through this man here. And he says in verse 21, And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it had cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. He was saying, look, Jesus, if you can do anything, we just need help. We're desperate. Just have compassion on us. Understand what we're going through. And sometimes we can even, even though we're spirit-filled, we can feel a little bit like this. Just have compassion on us. Just help me through this. Just help us. How many of us, you know, been in those situations? I know I have when, you know, your child's sick. I know when um, Tom had asthma once and uh, we were praying for him and uh, he was just absolutely gasping for breath, you know, and I thought he was going to die, you know, and uh, he had this asthma and we're just speaking in tongues at the top of our voices and, uh, you know, you're almost in desperation, Lord, have compassion on us and uh, 
praise the Lord, he was healed from asthma from that day forth, and he was only a young lad at the time, and, uh, and, and the Lord hears and he helps us, and sometimes, you know, we need to do that, don't we? We really just call out to him and say, look, Lord, just have compassion on me, help me through this situation. In verse 23, and Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. That is the greatest way really to approach the Lord at times. You know, I know I've been healed sometimes where I say, Lord, I believe. My mind might be thinking other things, but I believe it's up to you. And, uh, and the Lord hears us. He helps us in our unbelief. He helps us get through these things. Maybe we're in tears. Maybe we're in desperation. But he understands and he is faithful. And it says in verse 25, When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore, came out of him, and he is... He was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. That's what the Lord does. He takes us by the hand, he lifts us up, and he rises us up above our problems. And, you know, whenever we go through problems, you know, I think it... (laughs) Yeah, you know, I was going to read about Paul about you know when I'm weak then I'm strong etc. But we're not going to go through that. But but when we go through problems, the next time we go through a problem, we think, oh, the Lord will get me through this. <laughs> I can get through this. You know, no matter what we go through, the Lord does get us through. And all the people said, we'll leave it then. Hand back to Brother Jeff. <laughs>